Linda was waiting for a cab. It was Sunday, and she had gone with Mark to his training session. She had arranged to take a cab home from the stadium and had secretly saved Mark's phone number in her phone. While she waited, her thoughts drifted back to Friday night. She still couldn't believe that Mark had walked up and asked her to dance. She was over the moon when they danced, and even more so when he offered to take her home for the night. She instantly decided to accept, and Dee helped her slip away from Jim without any issues. Her thoughts turned to Jim, her husband, and she felt a pang of remorse. She knew he would be upset that she had left him like this, but she also knew he would forgive her. Jim had always given her everything she wanted, and this time would be no exception. She knew it would hurt him, but in the end, what she wanted was all that mattered to him. When she got home, she would have to explain that it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and she simply had to take it. After all, it was Mark Lavalier. Mark drove her to his mansion, and throughout the ride, his hands slowly crept up her legs, teasing her without quite touching her. When they reached his house, he pulled her to him, and their first kiss was soft, almost tentative. His tongue explored her mouth, and his hands unzipped her dress. As he stepped back, the straps of her dress slid down her shoulders, falling to the floor, followed by her bra. His hands began caressing her body, exploring every inch that her dress had once hidden. In response, she started unbuttoning his pants, finally seeing what she had been craving. Oh, this is going to be fun, she thought. Excuse me, miss, did you call for a cab? What? Oh yes, sorry, I got carried away. She quickly got into the cab and gave the driver her address. So, are you a fan? The driver asked. Do you think they have a chance this year with Mark on the team? I was expecting better last season. Who takes off work for a sore pinky toe? I worked through worse, and he got time off for a little finger injury. Well, I guess that's just how it is. The driver continued chatting almost non-stop on the 30-minute drive, while Linda daydreamed about the weekend she had just spent with Mark. He had taken her multiple times on Friday night and all through Saturday. Before she knew it, the cab pulled into her driveway, and she was surprised not to see Jim's car. She paid the driver, walked up to the door, and realized she had left her keys at the hotel. She knocked on the door, but no one answered. She rang the doorbell, but still no response. After 20 minutes of knocking and ringing the bell, frustration set in. She went around to the back door, which was never locked, and was relieved when the knob turned. Inside, the house was quiet. She called out to Jim but heard nothing in return. Certain he wasn't home, she went upstairs, ran herself a bath, and sank into the hot water. Her muscles ached from a weekend of indulgence. In all the years she had been with Jim, he had always been a tender lover. But Mark? Mark took what he wanted without hesitation, treating her like the woman she always secretly longed to be. As she soaked, her thoughts drifted back to Mark and the number of times he had brought her to climax over the weekend. She couldn't even count how many times he had done it on Friday night alone. It had truly been a once-in-a-lifetime experience. But as the water cooled, her thoughts returned to Jim. She knew he would be angry, but she was confident that good sex would make him forgive her. A wicked thought crossed her mind, maybe he would even allow her to see Mark again. Or maybe that was asking too much. Still, she could always ask Dee to cover for her the next time Mark wanted to see her. Thinking of Dee, she grabbed her phone and called her. Hey, girl, how was it? Dee asked. It was heaven. I've been soaking for the last hour trying to get rid of all the pain in my body. Wow, sounds like it was worth it. Oh yeah, he even gave me his number so we can meet up again. Yeah, like Jim's going to let that happen. Speaking of the loser, was he mad when you got home? No, he wasn't even here. I bet he's at his parents' house sulking. I'm going to call him when I get out of this bath and tell him what I think of him for not being here when I got home. Wait, you just got home today? Yeah, just before I got in the tub. Mark kept me busy all day yesterday, and even a few times this morning. Then we went to watch him practice. And Jim wasn't home? No, like I said, 
he's probably at his parents' house. They spent the next hour chatting about Linda's weekend, leaving Dee envious and frustrated. By the time they hung up, the bathwater had gone cold, so Linda got out, dressed, and realized it was already dinner time. The kids would need to eat soon or their schedules would be thrown off. She called Jim's parents' house. His mom answered, Hi, Mom. Is Jim home? No, dear. I thought he was with you. He called last night and said he needed to get away from the cold, so he took a flight and left. Okay, I'll try his cell. Thanks, Mom. Wait, why didn't you go with him? I had some things to take care of this weekend. Sorry, Mom, I have to go. Linda hung up and tried Jim's cell phone, but it went straight to voicemail. She left a frustrated message and then began searching the house for her luggage. It wasn't anywhere to be found. She walked past the kitchen and noticed the answering machine light blinking. Pressing play, she listened as the first message was from the hotel, asking about her luggage, which had been left in the room on Saturday. Damn him, she thought. He hadn't even bothered to pick up her things. She grabbed the spare keys from the garage and drove to the hotel to retrieve her belongings. On the way back, she stopped at the store to buy a bottle of wine, but when she went to pay, her cards were declined. Embarrassed, she left the wine behind and headed home. When she called the bank, she learned that her cards had been reported stolen and cancelled. New ones would arrive in 7 to 10 business days. Frustrated but resigned, she called Jim again. No answer. Another voicemail left. Each unanswered call made her angrier. He wasn't acting like himself. He should have been glad she was back. Instead, he seemed to be punishing her. But for what? He should have been thrilled to see her again, to reclaim her after the weekend she had spent away. It wasn't like she'd done anything to truly hurt him, not in her mind. Mark was a temporary thrill, a diversion, and nothing more. Jim had to understand that. After all, hadn't she always been there for him, given him everything he asked for? She deserved this one indulgence, didn't she? On Monday, Linda went to work as usual, but the day felt anything but normal. Her mind was constantly drifting to Jim and the kids. It wasn't like him to just pick up and leave without a word. He had every right to take the kids somewhere for a mini vacation, but the problem was, he hadn't said a word to her about it. He had simply left. That night, she called family and friends again, trying to figure out where Jim might have gone with the kids. Everyone had different guesses. His brother suggested he might have taken them to the family cabin by the lake. Whenever Jim needed time to think, he always retreated to that cabin. It was remote, quiet, and peaceful, the perfect place for him to clear his head. The more Linda thought about it, the more convinced she became that Jim had taken the kids there. They all loved the lake, and it wasn't unusual for them to spend a weekend there. The only problem was that there was no cell service at the cabin, and the only way to get there was by plane. Jim had his own seaplane, which he kept in a small hangar by the lake, so it was possible he had flown there. By Tuesday, Linda was growing desperate. Jim still hadn't returned any of her calls. When she tried his cell again, it went straight to voicemail as usual. She left another angry message, her tone growing more venomous with each call. How dare he, she thought. He's trying to punish me, isn't he? Later that day, she went to the bank to withdraw some cash, only to be told that there was almost nothing left in their accounts. Jim had emptied them. Not just the household accounts, but the home repair fund as well. Linda was furious. She immediately called his office, only to find out that Jim had quit. Human Resources told her that he had been given his final paycheck and his retirement fund. He had taken everything. It was then that Linda realized the extent of Jim's plan. He wasn't just punishing her, he was disappearing, taking everything with him. In a frantic search, Linda discovered that Jim had taken all of her jewelry and valuables from the safe. The children's rooms were nearly empty, most of their clothes were gone. The realization hit her like a punch to the gut, Jim had planned this meticulously. 
He had taken the kids, the money, and anything of value. He had left her with nothing. Jim's car was later found at the airport, but there was no trace of him or the children. His passport and the children's passports were missing, and the authorities confirmed that his plane had flown south. But instead of leaving on Saturday, like Linda had originally assumed, Jim hadn't left until Tuesday, after she had already returned home. He had waited, perhaps to ensure that he wasn't being followed, before disappearing. He had flown to Belize and then vanished again, heading west. There was no way to track him. He had covered his tracks too well. It was as if he and the children had simply disappeared into thin air. Linda was devastated. She tried to explain the situation to her friends and family, but no one believed that Jim would have taken the kids and run. He wasn't that kind of man, they said. They couldn't believe that he was capable of such an act. But when the truth came out about what Linda had done that fateful weekend, most of her friends turned their backs on her. They couldn't understand how she could have betrayed Jim like that. Even those who had once been close to her no longer wanted anything to do with her. The only person who stayed by her side was Dee. Despite everything, Dee listened to her, sympathized with her, and tried to offer comfort. But it wasn't enough. Linda's life had spiraled out of control. Without Jim's income, she couldn't afford to keep the house. The bills piled up until she was forced to file for bankruptcy. Eventually, she lost the house altogether. Her credit was ruined, and she began drinking to numb the pain. Two years passed, and Linda hit rock bottom. She lost her job after showing up drunk too many times. Now, working at a new firm, she was slowly trying to rebuild her life. She had moved in with her parents and no longer socialized with her old friends. Most of her time was spent working or searching for any clue that might lead her to Jim and the kids. She knew, deep down, that there was little hope of ever finding them, but she kept searching anyway. One day, while sitting at her computer in her old bedroom at her parents' house, she received an email. It was titled February Sucks. Normally, Linda wouldn't open an email from a stranger, but something compelled her to click on it. The message read, Dear Linda, I'm sure you've realized by now that we're not coming back. Your actions that night, and knowing what would happen if I divorced you, left me with no other option. I could either pay you to stay in my life and be a part-time father, or I could take drastic measures. I chose the latter. I'm writing this to tell you that I've moved on, and you should too. I've found someone, and she loves the kids. They love her too. We're happy. Move on with your life. Find someone new. And remember what happened in February. No one would tolerate such disrespect. The email wasn't signed, but Linda didn't need a signature. She knew it was from Jim. Tears welled up in her eyes as she stared at the screen. All because of one night of madness with Mark Lavalier, a night that had destroyed her life. Six weeks after Mark had dropped her off, he was dead, shot by the husband of his latest conquest. At first, the news reports had painted Mark as a victim, but as the truth about the number of marriages he had ruined came to light, he was quickly reviled. His death was no longer a tragedy, but a fitting end to a man who had caused so much pain. Now, Linda sat alone in her parents' house, daydreaming about how her life could have been different if she had never agreed to that damn dance with Mark Lavalier. The pain of her choices haunted her, and she couldn't escape the cold, bitter truth. February really did suck.